Church, happy Easter. Thank you so much for joining us. We are right here in a studio celebrating. Um, is it safe to say like this is the most important Easter in human history? because it is the only Easter we really have. We are here, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus did not just die, but he rose again, just like he predicted. And I wanna remind everybody around the world, it is because of Easter Sunday that we don't follow a dead guy who was a good preacher and miraculously healed a few people. We worship a living God who proved everything he said is true, all the miracles he did because he's divine. Jesus is not just a good man. He's not just a good teacher, preacher, or a warm, loving person who took care of senior citizens. He's actually the living God and he's alive. And it's on this day that around the world, billions of people are celebrating that our superhero, Jesus, proved that he's everything he said he was because he beat death just the way he predicted he would. So we're going to celebrate that. We're going to lean into that story. I got to be honest with you, I love Easter as a preacher because it's the one Sunday that you just preach the same thing. <laughs> and I just want to say to preachers everywhere, if you're coming up with new content on Easter, you got to stop that. Like, there's only one thing to talk about on Easter, and it is the empty tomb. So I, I, I feel really exhilarated every time Easter rolls around. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is the old Resurrection Sunday. You get to preach the same message. Uh, actually, I do kind of feel that way, but it's always an anticipated day because it is a day we come together and we celebrate life. We celebrate purpose. We celebrate meaning. We celebrate uh, that there is one true God and he is alive. Ooh, there has been a myriad of great teachers and thinkers and writers and healers and helpers and lovers. Jesus, Jesus stands head and shoulders above them all because when they came to visit his grave, he was gone. And then he appeared to hundreds of people and levitated into the sky. To be honest, everything we believe hinges on this day that we celebrate and commemorate Jesus. So you can imagine, I'm pretty pumped, uh, pretty excited. Uh, I'm also, uh, I want to announce to our church, for those who care here in the Western world, there's this little league called the National Football League. And I would like to announce on this Easter that I am now additionally a major Denver Broncos fan. So uh, I must throw that in there. Speaking of which, uh, I played quarterback in high school. Now, I know that's not a surprise to you when you look at my frame. I hate you guys. Um, I'll just talk to the camera. There's nicer people in the camera. Um, I, I played high school football. Now, my dad was a pretty good high school football player. He was also a quarterback. And so I thought I got my two boys sitting here. I thought, you know, I want to be like dad. So I'm going to play quarterback. So went to a high school called Issaquah High School. Anyone from Washington State watching or in the room of few of, uh, okay, you're right. I, well, I'm obviously my family's nodding. Yeah, I know you're from Washington state. Um, Issaquah high school, clearly the greatest high school in the history of the state of Washington. So I went out for the football team. I'll never forget. I told the sophomore coach, I said, coach, I'm the quarterback. He goes, we already got a quarterback. He saw me throw the football. I don't want to brag. And he's like, well, maybe you will be our quarterback. But the truth is, as the season went on again, I was a sophomore. I was the starting sophomore quarterback. I was the backup junior varsity quarterback, and I was the third string varsity quarterback. I don't want to get homecoming came around in my sophomore year, and I went in to meet with coach because someone like, I think I'd watched like a movie where one of the football players is like, coach, I want to play. Put me in the game. So I got all motivated. So I went in to talk to the head coach. I kind of forget his name now, but I was like, coach, can I have a minute? You know? And he's, I did, I did. And he goes, this is all just coming to me right now. I forgot about this story. And he goes, yeah, sure. He called me Smith. He's like, yeah, sure. Smith. Remember when like football coaches only called you by your last name? Cause that was like cool. And your last name was like in tape in the front helmet. Some of you like, I didn't play football. Why are you talking to me? Like I play football. But anyways, he's like, sure. Smith, what do you got? And I go, coach, I know I'm just a sophomore. I said, but I'd really like to suit up for homecoming. And he, and, he, and he goes, really? And I go, yeah. Now, I think I'm third string from best I can tell. You know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I was like, I just, I'd love to suit up. 
It doesn't matter the number, but I just like to honor my family. I want to suit up, run out with the team. And, and I said this. I go, of course, coach, you know, if God forbid our quarterbacks, our two quarterbacks get hurt. This is a real story. I have not remembered this till right now, Easter 2022. I said, coach, my thoughts, if two of the guys get hurt, I guess I'm up. He gets quiet. He goes, well, I, I hear you, Smith. He, he said, the truth is we, uh, you know, the running back. And he said his name. Go, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, he, I guess if it came to that, we'll just go ahead and play him at quarterback. <laughs> and I, that's a true story. And I go, coach, does that mean I can't suit up? And he looked at me like, you're finally picking up what I'm laying down, young man. <laughs> yeah, so that was my football career. Uh, that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. No, I'm kidding. Um, it was the last game of our sophomore team. I think we went 500. I threw for 749 yards and seven touchdowns. I don't remember the specifics. And um, I promise you this is no word of a lie. I'm a preacher. I don't lie. Um, it was the last play. Now, we didn't know ne necessarily it was the last play. It was like two minutes left to go in the fourth quarter. It was the last game of the season. There's no playoffs for sophomore teams. And so uh, I, it, it's third down, and coach calls a timeout. Now, the sophomore coach, he loved me. He loved me. He knew my dad was a preacher, and he, was kind of, he thought that was cool, too. And he, he goes, Smith, get over here. And he calls a timeout, and I run over, and I'm wearing number 17, all purple, helmet's way too big, right? And I run over there, and I go, what is it, coach? He goes, you ever heard of, like, like, like dropping back in the pocket? He said, "This I promise you, the last play of my entire football career as a quarterback. He goes, Smith, I have told you so many times. When you hike the ball, you have to take a three-step drop. That will give you distance in the pocket and give you time to throw the ball. We're throwing a bomb to McFadden. True story, I ran into McFadden. Derek McFadden, I think was his name, about three or four years ago. I go, McFadden? He's like, Smith! You know? So this is the story, true story. He goes, we're going deep to McFadden. He wore number 42, like that matters. So I said, all right. He goes, now listen, I want you to take three big steps back, give yourself some room, and then just, Smith, throw it as hard as you can. This is sophomore football, okay? He's like, just, just throw it as hard as you can. So true story. Last play of my whole football career, I hiked the ball, and I, for the first time, I go one, two, three. And in real time, it dawns on me, I can kind of see the field. I got some space, and I got some time. <laughs> it's a true story. And I throw the ball as hard as I can. It's a little short. McFadden comes back. He catches it. He, he jukes his guy and scores a touchdown on the last play of my football career. was probably a 72-yard bump. All right, it was 22 yards. But the point is, <laughs> after all the football I played from Pop Warner all the way to my sophomore year, the last play as a quarterback, I finally realized how you play quarterback. You can't play quarterback in, again, forgive me for those that aren't familiar with American football, but you can't hike the ball and just do this because you, you're going to get hit. And, 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 and boy, boy, did I get hit. Uh, I got tackled so many times. My mom took me to Big Five, and she bought me one of those, like, jackets that protect you. And I finally told mom, I go, mom, I can't even move. She goes, ah, you won't get hurt. Who cares? You know, so I, you know, I had the big old flak jacket because I didn't know how, well, frankly, I didn't know how to play quarterback until the last play. W what am I trying to say? You know, on this Easter, I just had this thought. I wonder sometimes in our journey of faith, in our relationship with God, if sometimes we're kind of like me trying to play quarterback. We love God. We love football. We want, to, we want to be good. We want to be great. We want to know him. We want to help people. But we don't know actually how it works, how it works. And I want to describe to you in just in the next few moments actually how it works. And so the title of my 2022 Easter sermon is Tombs We Try. Tombs We Try. And I want to suggest just for a few minutes for all of my friends in the studio and everybody watching that Maybe we're trying things that actually don't work. They're not that effective. I got good news. 
there's not going to be any part of this verbal presentation where you're going to feel bad about your efforts. I just want to say, if you're like me in sophomore football, you're just trying not to get hit. You're trying to have a pretty good life. You want to be able to kind of score some touchdowns and enjoy some camaraderie. And so I don't think when it comes to our journey with Jesus that we intend to do things that frustrate our faith journey. I think we're all trying. One of my favorite things to say in today's unprecedented global situation, it's a nice way to say it, is actually most people are just trying their best, aren't they? They're just trying their best. It's one of my favorite things to say about people, you know, so-and-so, I mean, you know, they're just trying their best. It's all you know, right? All you know sometimes is all you know. And I just, I dream about a community all over the world. You know, we're in 46 countries now as a church. Do you know, literally last year, 16.4 million people engaged with church home. 16.4 different million people in the world engaged with church home. I want to say to church home all over the world, you're making a difference. Everybody in this room, you're making a difference. And so I think about 46 countries, almost 17 million people at some point or another. Now, I'm sure we count like when someone clicks on a sermon for 30 seconds and clicks off. They're counted as well, okay? So I'm not saying it's a real deep connection, okay? But nonetheless, right, it's, it's millions of people and it is exciting and it is meaningful. And you know what? We're all out there in the world and we're trying, aren't we? We're trying. And it's a lot like me in sophomore football. You keep getting sacked. You keep getting hit. You can't score a touchdown and you're like, what's wrong? And I just hope you don't have to wait till your final play to realize there's something you can do that could actually change your whole experience. Better yet, actually, there's something you can understand. There's something you can receive today on this Easter that could change your entire faith journey. That brings us to the resurrection story. We're going to look at Luke chapter 24 today and just the first seven verses. And I want to read it to you in the Passion Translation. It's so good. They're going to put it up on the screen. Very early that Sunday morning, the women, two Marys actually, the women made their way to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. Isn't that interesting? They are preparing to cover the scent of death. Arriving at the tomb, they discovered that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside. So they went in to look, but the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was in fact gone. They stood there naturally stunned and perplexed. Suddenly two men in dazzling white robes, shining like lightning, appeared above them. That's a wild description, isn't it? Like lightning, wow. These poor ladies, now they're scared again, (laughs) terrified. They fall to the ground on their faces. The men in white say this to them. Listen to this question. It's a question. Why would you look for the living one in a tomb? He's not here. He's risen. And it's kind of the question I want us to sink into today on this Easter as a community. Why are you looking for the living one in a tomb? Why are you looking for the living one in a tomb? And I want to talk to you about the tombs we try to get to God through. The tombs we go into because we think we're going to meet him there, but he is alive, which proves the world has changed as we know it. There is a new age, my brothers and sisters, and we're living in it. There's a new era. There's a new dispensation. There's a new covenant. There's a new connection. There's new access. God is available to all. In any religion, philosophy, or theology that propagates the exclusive elite few misappropriates Resurrection Sunday. For Resurrection Sunday is the declaration and the dawning of a new age. Why? Why would you, li- why would you live and look among dead things for what is alive? The dazzling angels go on to say, have you forgotten what he said to you while he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man is destined to be handed over to sinful men to be nailed to a cross, and on the third day he will rise again. I want to remind you now, thousands of people died by Roman crucifixion. 
There are accounts of other people who've actually come back from the dead. I've actually met a few people who were clinically declared dead and they came back to life. Maybe you have too. It's amazing. I've heard stories and I'm 43 now. I've been preaching since I was 16. I've been to some wild church services and I'm sure a lot of it was true and some of it probably wasn't, but man, was it fun, right? I heard resurrection stories from all kinds of different people. I was dead and I saw a light and Jesus visited me and he said he gave me a choice and I chose life and I came back to life. I mean, just amazing stories that have always encouraged me. And sometimes if you're a thinking person, you get to resurrection Easter Sunday and you're like, yeah, but is he the only person that ever died? Is he the only person that ever came back to life? Is he really that unique? Well, let's dig into that just for a moment because this will be important for us as we move on. First of all, he is the only person to die on a cross who never committed one crime. He's the only person in antiquity for thousands of years that was crucified on a Roman cross who was sinless and perfect. In fact, you might question his perfection and his sinlessness, so I bring you back to the crucifixion. While in agony and excruciating pain, Jesus hung between two criminals, if you remember the story. Now, one of the criminals, he was a little sarcastic and brash. He said, if you're God, why are you hanging on a tree like us? But the other guy, listen to this now, he leans over and says, are you kidding me, man? We deserve to be crucified. We're criminals. Listen to what he says, but this man has done nothing wrong, which is to say even his reputation around town was, I ain't never seen him do anything wrong. His own reputation spoke for itself. This man hanging next to him, do you imagine, can you imagine how valid the information needs to be for you to be hanging next to a person and claim that he's perfect? That's how sparkling the reputation of Jesus was, even though there were so many who intended to taint it and created lies about him that weren't true. He was so transcendent. He was so wonderful. He is so perfect. He is so gregarious. He is so gracious that his reputation spoke for himself. So yes, thousands of people died, but only one died perfect. And then we would say, well, many people have come back to life. What's the big deal? How many have you ever heard of who their death, burial, and their coming back to life was predicted hundreds of years, argue maybe more than a thousand years before, and furthermore, when they arrive and they become of age, the person who will come back from the dead for three years publicly told everyone exactly what he was gonna do and what day he would come back. Now that, once again, Jesus stands alone. He died perfect, and he rose on the exact day he said he would. That's why the angel said, you don't remember? This isn't a surprise. He knew he would do this. This is Jesus' way of saying, I'm not just a good thinker, teacher, philosopher. I am the incarnate God, incarnation. I'm not just here for information. I'm here for you to behold the incarnation, to feel me to touch me, to see me, to know me. God, Emmanuel, God is amongst us and he is near. How do we know? Because of Easter. Now, some of you know the story enough to know that without the resurrection, Christianity as we know it would still be a scared few people in a locked room. For after he died, that was the state of our belief system. The state of the whole of Christianity could be summed up in a few anxious, fearful, terrified, pathetic, average people in a locked room. So afraid that when reports came back to the locked room of Christianity, they said, we don't believe it. Mary and Mary show up and they're like, yo, it's his body's gone. And we remembered what he said. And they're like, yeah, right? So the truth is what we're celebrating today is that without the resurrection, in fact, you might not like this verse. The Bible says, without the resurrection of all people, Christians are the most pathetic. Do you know this Bible says that? In the New Testament, it says you're you're insane. Here you are propagating this guy who's just a guy. 
But if he got up from the grave, we have more actual documentation about the validity life ministry of Jesus than many of our American icons. He lived. A lot of people want to argue about the Hebrew Bible. Is it real? Is it metaphor? Is it this? All, all I'm here to declare on this Easter Sunday is that the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus was an actual fact, historical fact, and my entire belief system is wrapped up in this event. For when Jesus rose from the dead, so did we. There's life. There's meaning. There's hope. Maybe we do have a superhero. And I'm down for all the superhero movies. But why are we so predisposed to superheroism? Because we crave it at the core of our being. Deliver us. Save us. And his, his response was, I have. And so, everything's changed. There are certain events that change everything. There are certain events that change everything. And this one changes everything. For up until the resurrection, that is what we call Easter Sunday, God could be accessed, how should I say, very carefully, very delicately. In fact, if you didn't approach God right, you'd die. Maybe you've seen uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Maybe you've seen people's faces melting on this. That's a good, that's good theology. Without Jesus, good luck trying to get to God. I mean, good luck trying to, you know, find your favorite restaurant at night without your Google Maps, let alone finding God. How do we find God? How do we get God? How do we garner God? Well, we, we try a lot of stuff though, don't we? Why? Listen to the, listen to the angels again. Why, why do you seek the living one in a tomb? I want to answer that question because I, I have an answer. I want to tell you why two sparkling guys in your really nice robes that are like lightning. Um, cause I'm a human. And last thing I heard is he was here. So that's all I know. I'll tell you why we try tombs. Because we're normal. We're average. In my relationship with other human beings, I, in a way, have to earn it and deserve it. I got to, one scripture says, you want friends, you got to be friendly. So we take our interactions with each other and we, we suppose that that too is required with the divine. I must be kind, I must be, I must, you know. I mean, are you like me? You still got friends who are like, yo, man, I don't know if I can come to your church on Easter, bro. I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't think you understand what I actually do during the week, okay? Like I can't, because why? We still think we gotta get to God. And so we try normal, natural stuff to get to God. So do you and so do I. You're like that sophomore quarterback guy. Oh, that's right, me. You hike the ball and your instincts say, now get rid of it. And no one taught you that there's a whole nother way that you can actually be you, be a quarterback, be... And boy, we take so many hits in this life not knowing the truth. We think that we get to God a number of different ways, and, 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 and the list is so long, but I, I wanna share five prominent tombs we go to often to get God. And I'm just telling you, He's not there. The first tomb we try is rules. What are you doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm here to keep the rules. Well, how do you seek the living one among a tomb? Rules aren't dead. Oh, as it relates to getting to God, they are. What? Oh, you, you, you need rules in football, so the metaphor breaks down. We get it, but not. No, rules is not how you get to God anymore. The Ten Commandments isn't how you get to God anymore. 
It's not, that's not what Easter Sunday is. Easter Sunday isn't the day where Jesus got up from the grave and said, come out, come and find me if you can. Here I go. Ready? It's like an Easter egg hunt. I'm going to hide and the noble few will find me. And the preachers will teach you how to be noble and find God. But me and my buddies, man, we don't mean to, but we do sometimes. We weave into the story of resurrection life, this tombless living romance with God. But our nature takes over, and even in our sermons, we reintroduce lifeless dead things that we think garner God, like rules. Well, I keep the rules. Perfect. I ain't got nothing to do with your access to God. Why? Why do you think your rules will get you to God? I'll tell you why. Because you're normal. Because we're natural. And there are laws and rules in this life. And so preachers like me say, you know, there's laws in the universe like gravity. You got to honor God's laws. To get God? No, you don't. Nobody wants to say it. No, you don't. Now, if you want to have a savings account, there's probably some laws and rules you should abide by, but we ain't here talking about your savings account. We're talking about your connection to God. It doesn't happen with rules. Here's another tomb we go to and we try. Um, effort. Right? God's the proverbial football coach. And what he's telling me to do is try harder. You know how many times my football coach grabbed my face mask, my least favorite part? Look at me. Do you think that I am a rough and tumble football player? It was never, I was never meant for football. Look at me. Ask yourself, football in what world? Place kicker? Maybe. But even they get hit sometimes when things go wrong. I don't want to do that. Someone's like, fight or no fight? No fight. Pain or no pain? No pain. Advil for life. Like, what? Coach would grab me by the face mask. Smith, I want to see some passion out there. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying. I'm like, I want to go home and watch Sports Center and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I'm an artist, you know. Get me out of these pads. All these pads my mom bought me. I can't move. I was like the abominable snowman on the football field, right? Like, I don't, I need more effort. All right, all right, coach. I would come back in the huddle, sophomore football. All right, guys, let's. Let's get her going. Like, I mean, I don't even, I'm not, I don't, I don't care that much, but we do that with God. I watched uh, Tiger Woods Hall of Fame speech recently, and it was, it was so moving. And listening to Tiger's philosophy on life, and I thought, that's good for golf. Like, it really is. Put in the time, put in the work, put in the effort, train, train, train. That's good for golf, bad for God. It doesn't work with God. That's not how it works. It's not your effort that God goes. I mean, just imagine just for a moment. Whoa! Have you seen these guys' effort? Their effort is so impressive to me as God. All right, I'm going to save them. They've given me enough passion, enough. Oh. No. But we keep going back to effort. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try harder. Some of you, it's, it's, it's Easter. Easter is like the New Year's for Christian. You know, it's like, okay, all right, it's a new day, resurrection. All right, now this Easter, I'm not going to cuss anymore. You know, or I'm not going to cheat on my taxes this year. That'd probably be a good thing. But, you know, like, I'm not. And I'm, how are you going to do it? I'm going to determine to do it. It's called old-fashioned human willpower. Oh, that sounds like the gospel to me. It's not by might. It's not by strength. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. Here's another tomb we try to get to God, a goodness. I'm just trying to be a good guy. That's the pervasive thought today. 
If you're like me, I'm exasperated with all the philosophies and concepts and theologies and too. I mean, and all the abuse of religions and world religions. And honestly, I don't blame anyone for being like, I'm just trying to be a good guy, man. I don't know what to believe anymore. Everybody's a fraud and a fake. And I don't know, I, I, I'm just disillusioned. I'm just going to be a good person, which means like going to tip reasonably good at the restaurant, I guess, and like hold some doors open and like look at people in the eyes, like these basic things that I don't know how they got lost, but these are the new definitions of good. Like I'm a good listener. Like, is that like... Is that where we're at? You know, like, I really like to listen when people talk. Is that noble or is that being a human, right? But that's where we're at. I'm just going to be a good person. I ain't got nothing. Please, to all 17 million people watching, like Judah, 17 million people are not watching right now. Everybody relax. But to everyone watching, I'm down with being good. But you think it's your goodness where God goes, Michael, angels, everyone, look how good they are. I have never seen such goodness. They're so good. I got to include them in my family because I'm looking for good people to enlist. I'm looking for good. Who did Jesus befriend and hang out with? Honestly, the motliest crew possible in antiquity. You know who his favorite people were? Who the culture said bad. That's the people he went to dinner with. That's the people he ate with. That's the people he hung out with multiple times. Multiple times. He was publicly seen eating, which was an intimate act in antiquity, eating with the bad people. God was with bad people? Yeah, that's why I know he's with you. That's why I know he's with me. Why do you seek the living one? in a tomb. You think you're going to connect with God because you're good? Here's another tomb we use, information. Information. I am going to know all of the stats about God, and then I will access God. And here's what I have concluded, and, and, and all of the theologians out there won't like me for this, but you know it's true, and so do I. I'm old enough to know everyone dies with heresy. Everyone. What's heresy? It's a strong word. People don't like it. Uh, a misunderstanding of God that's pretty profound. You're going to die, and we're all going to get to eternity, eternity. And here's my thoughts on when we get there. We're all going to go, no way. <laughs> oh, man, my bad. He's going to go, I know. <laughs> and he's like, but you're adorable, bro. You were down there preaching that thing like it was true. And it wasn't. I think we're also going to see people in heaven and we're going to go, no way. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Preachers are going to be like, no way. <laughs> it's going to be wild because we keep thinking like um, the way to get God is know everything there is to know about him perfectly. That's how I'll get it. Why, why, do you, why do you seek the living one in a tomb? And lastly, and it's pretty obvious, but we, we try ceremonies, pomp and circumstance ceremonies. We love it. I think ceremonies are cool. I'm not against rules, effort, goodness, information, or ceremonies. I'm for all these things, but not as they relate to you garnering or getting to God. Because the resurrection proves it the opposite. It's a new age, it's a new era. We are down here in 2022 and you, you know what we persist? We persist to go find God and get God. We will institute rules and efforts and goodness and information and big ceremonies and pomp and circumstance and stained glass and I love stained glass and beautiful chapels. I want more beautiful chapels, right? Like I'm so into it, but we think that's going to do it. We're going to get God. And you know what Easter teaches us? You don't get God, God gets you. Wherever you are, he just comes and gets you. <laughs> These women are bringing spices. They're so cute. We're just like them. Mary and Mary are like, we're going to rub the spices in his dead body. We're going to make sure he doesn't smell. We're just going to cover the death. We're just going to be there for him. 
and they get there and there's nothing to do with the stuff that they have for dead things. And the two angels go, it's almost as if the angels don't understand what, what is wrong with the humans. They're like, so you weren't listening to all of his sermons? Do you remember he's not, he's not in your rules. He's not in your effort. He's not in your goodness. He's not in your information. He's not in your ceremonies. I mean, he can be present in all those spaces, but you know what I mean? Like that's, God didn't say, it's your rules, effort, goodness, information, ceremonies. And so I finally came. You gave me 23 years and you finally became good enough. And so now I choose you. You're my number one draft pick. <laughs> now he, now none of that matters as it relates to accessing the divine. He is Emmanuel, God with us. There's a pervasive thought and I'm done. Um, there was a whole era of the church that had this concept that people are far from God. And we need to reach people that are far from God. Nothing could be further from the truth. No matter how far you feel, He's near. He's available. He's accessible. And furthermore, He's in love with you. He's in love with you. You know what He is? He's one breath away. He's one hey away. He's one hello away. He's just right there. He's just, and he's, he's, um, you knew I was going to do it. I was going to incorporate my puppy. You knew it. <laughs> you knew it and I knew it. The question was when, not if. That dumb little dog. If he wasn't so dumb, he wouldn't be so wonderful. But I walk in, I have been gone for one minute and 30 seconds, and I come back to a ticker tape parade per his little tail. And he's looking at me like it's the first time he's ever seen me. And I'm like, oh, buddy, this is going to be hard to keep up. You got to relax a little bit. This has got to be hard on your little five pound frame. He's like, oh, he's back. You're the best. It's like, buddy, we got to like tone this down a little bit. But all he knows is just like, oh, I'm just so excited. God is so big and so wonderful and so sovereign and so unsearchable and so beyond, and he's nothing like little Louie. And yet, it's as if every time we say hello, he goes, hello. Every time we say, hey, hey, I'm just waiting for you. I'm right here. I'm right here. A friend going through a tragedy today, and I text him. I said, I'm right here, and I'm not going anywhere. It's the best thing I thought I could tell my friend who was in the hospital. I'm right here, and I'm not going anywhere. Let that be your message today from God to you. I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere. I don't even believe in you. I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere. I've turned my back on you. I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere. I, 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 I'm mad at you. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I, I, you know what? I'd rather live in tombs than be with you. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. He's near. He's accessible. He's available. He's God. He changes everything. Let's stop living like the resurrection didn't happen. Let's stop living by rules and effort and goodness and information and ceremonies. And please, for the love of all that is holy, let's stop propagating to other people that our belief system is like another religion in the world that teaches nobility and morality and efforts and rules to access the divine. No! We're unlike any other belief system in the world. For our God went to the grave and got up again, and he proved to anyone and everyone that all has access to him. Do you not know enough about God? Do you not understand how to be good enough for God? Do you not know the rules of God? Do you, not, you, you know nothing about the ceremonies of God? Good, because you don't need them to know God. Now, I think what's exciting is you start to love God and all of a sudden people perceive your life as being changed by rules. I, I heard that you've committed to only have sex with the person you're married to. That's a rule you keep, right? And you're like, it's not a rule. It's what I want to do. Jesus has changed my heart. It's love. And so now people will perceive, like Chelsea and I have been married 22 years. She's the only one I'm having sex with, just to be clear. And I like saying sex like that. 
And people will say, that's a good rule. And that's probably why God uses you. No, it's not. It's that I got God. He got me, changed me. It changed my marriage, changed my family, changed my friends, changed my schedule, changed where my money goes. And people think, oh, you got, you got good discipline. You got good. No, I don't. I'm just in love. And he's changed everything. Can I pray for you? God, I, I thank you. We don't have to try any more tombs for you are alive and a new age is upon us. A new day has dawned. The grace age, the grace era, unearned, unmerited favor and access to you. For you, Jesus, are enough. It is finished. And now we welcome your invasion in our everyday life. I thought I was getting you, but the whole time you were getting me. We love you. We love you. The wonderful one of the whole earth, we love you. The desire of all nations, we love you. The lily of the valley, we love you. The lion and the lamb, we love you. My thoughts and vocabulary fail me to describe the magnitude and the width and the enormousness of who you are. And I have never met anyone like you. For while we were still sinners, you died for us. You died for us. Thank you. If you're watching or you're in the studio today and you would like to receive, not earn, deserve, or warrant, not try through dead means the tombs we try, but you would like to receive the once and for all sacrificial death of the superhero of the ages who in case you doubted his validity he rose from the grave to say it's all true if you would like to receive this free forgiveness that only jesus offers on the count of three i'm gonna ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down that's not just for everybody in the studio that's for you right now in that park in the dorm room on the airplane wherever you are I know it might feel silly in 22B to raise your hand, but I think when we respond on the outside to what we know is true on the inside, it seems to solidify it, that's all. So you know who you are. If you want to receive the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus, <laughs> he got you, man. He got you. Just let go and yield. He got you. And you'll never be the same. On the count of three, you know who you are. One, two, three. If that's you, just slip up your hand and you can put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, you see hands, but you see hearts too. <laughs> and you see us to our deepest core and you love us and we love you. And we thank you for the minutes and the moments we share. And now I declare the blessing of God that maketh rich and add no sorrow to it will be the portion of your people at church home. Lord, for nearly 50 nations, countries around the world that are participating in millions of people, I declare the blessing of God on this Easter upon you and your children and your children's children. That the presence of God will be pervasive and prevalent in your home and in your life and wherever you go. That the Good Shepherd will be so tangible and manifest in your life that he will be the most real person in your journey. I just declare that over your people today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen.